so yeah so uh antarctica is magical and i was like struggling to kind of find a title for this presentation i said let me let me just keep it simple because it's just such a mesmerizing place and every time i've kind of gone back there it's been like a super special experience it's always been uh, a very different experience uh, we've seen very different places a very different side to antarctica each time and i'll kind of touch upon that as we kind of go along a brief introduction about me uh, i'm shriram i am one of the co-founders of data photography i also lead uh, uh, the wildlife photography tours as well as a whole bunch of expeditions for data uh, i'm a professional wildlife photographer in addition to data i also take up assignments where i document uh, wildlife for uh, different organizations and different places uh, i been through the traditional track so i did my engineering and then i did my mba worked for a while in the corporate sector and uh, then eventually decided that i wanted to pursue wildlife and wildlife photography just it's so much more interesting there's so much to learn every day there is every day is a different day and i guess that's what kind of got me into this and that's actually a photograph from my first trip to antarctica i was like just so mind blown by it that i i would just pick up my camera and shoot in all directions wherever possible a quick thing about data again yeah we've been around for about uh, 12 plus years now uh photography travel around the globe so we've now focusing completely on photography expeditions photography travel looking at places which are uh, you know the dream destinations kind of things things that go beyond the conventions uh we are of course a passionate team of professional photographers and mentors my colleague manish is right now in kyrgyzstan leading uh, a private expedition uh, for a, for a group of people from greece so one of the questions that always comes up when i talk about antarctica is have you seen polar bears right and that's like a very very uh, typical question that keeps coming up so and there is like uh, the thing about antarctica or the poles being where the polar bears are which unfortunately is which like is not exactly the truth what happens is you have uh, polar bears only in the north and penguins in the south right so polar so that's the reason the arctic is actually called the arctic because arctos translates to bear and arctic is where the bears are the anti of arctic is antarctica and uh, you don't have any polar bears there so the penguins are fairly safe from land predators if you will uh, they have a lot of other predators which we'll talk about in a bit but uh, there are no polar bears in antarctica it's they are only found in the north and you have penguins which are found only in the south they are largely found in the southern hemisphere with the northernmost population northernmost species being found around the equator so let's talk about uh the adventure to antarctica how the whole thing actually unfolds over a period of time right so uh where is antarctica antarctica is if you see those sign boards it's really really far from every place on earth literally it is the most isolated continent of them all uh if you see the uh, the globe antarctica is right there at the bottom of the globe as in that's how we kind of represent it right the north and the south so it's like the southern most continent in the world it's the continent that surrounds the south pole and if you look at it all the land masses if you uh, whether you take australia or uh, africa or south america they are quite far away from uh, the continent of antarctica now how do you get there from these places right so africa if you see if you actually look at it is quite far australia is really far the closest is from south america from the tip of argentina and chile that's where antarctica gets a little bit accessible uh it's the most extreme of continents in a lot of ways it's not just the most isolated continent uh it's the fifth largest continent of course it's almost twice the size of australia the maps don't do much credit to that but it's it's actually a massive continent 
the coldest recorded temperature is what is also the coldest recorded temperature on the on the face of the earth which is about minus 89.2 degrees celsius uh about 98 percent of the continent is covered in ice averaging about 1.9 meters of thickness and that ice actually contains about 90 percent of the world's fresh water and that's what actually also makes antarctica really really special we'll talk about that later in the presentation when we talk about global warming and things it's a polar desert. A lot of areas in Antarctica haven't received any rainfall in over 2 million years. So although there is so much ice and uh, so much of fresh water that is stored in Antarctica, it's still the driest part. It's, it's a desert. And uh, Antarctica is also a place that has never been populated. The only continent that has never had a permanent human population. There is there is a temporary population these days of about 1,000 to 5,000 people depending on the season. Uh, the population comes down considerably in winters and goes up to about 5,000 people in summers. These are people who work in the research stations of different countries. So when we talk about Antarctica expedition, right? So we talked about traveling from the tip of South America down uh, to the continent of Antarctica. So we typically go on a small luxury uh, expedition ship. These ships are built for traveling to the poles. They are uh, really strengthened hulls and stuff to travel through the ice. And uh, these ships typically range in capacity from 100 to 400 people. Uh, of course, the, the key consideration there being that we'll talk about the Drake Passage going forward, but you need a ship which is about a considerable size to be able to get to Antarctica and back safely and in reasonable comfort. So that's one of the ships that we had taken in 2018 uh, on my second uh, expedition there. So where do we start? We start at the tip of South America. At the tip of South America, there is this group of islands called Tierra del Fuego. Extremely pretty place. This is the southern tip of uh, Patagonia, the range of Patagonia. And uh, it's got like a lot of uh, beautiful mountains, a lot of forests around the area. Extremely uh, a beautiful place. And this is where all my three expeditions so far have started. There's a place called Ushuaia, which is the southern tip of um, uh, Argentina. It's supposed to be the southernmost city in the world. Uh, that's what it called. They call it El Fin, uh, El fin del Mundo, which is the end of the earth. And it's a small town which used to be very, very, uh, which used to thrive uh, in the 80s and the 90s because of their very strong electronics industry, which has ever since, of course, uh, not seen the good times that we had seen earlier. But it is now a thriving uh, uh, expedition slash uh, uh, tourism town because one, it's of course the southernmost city in the world, but it also becomes one of the big gateways for Antarctica. So a lot of the, the, the cruise ships kind of uh, start at Ushuaia. The other place where ships also start from is uh, from Chile as well. So there are these two different places where uh, Antarctica expeditions typically start. Now, Ushuaia is a beautiful, beautiful place, not just as a, uh, as a as a starting point for Antarctica, but just going around, you see these fantastic mountains. This was shot from the city itself. You have these mountains all around. And you get a lot of very interesting things to see as well. Like there's a whole lot of birds that you see around the place. So there is really no, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're out with your camera, you really don't have any free time as such. You're just going around, clicking different things around town. So you have Karakaras, which are like falcons, very common around the town. Very beautiful woodpeckers called Megalanic woodpeckers with their red heads. Uh, turkey vultures. You have very large kingfishers called ring kingfishers. Chilean skuas. Uh, these are quite notorious because they kind of steal from other birds as well quite uh, quite a bit. And you have Magellanic penguins. So if you actually take a short uh, boat ride out of uh, Ushuaia uh, to, to a couple of these islands where the penguins breed, you actually start seeing your first penguins around there itself. These are Magellanic penguins. These are found only around the coast of Argentina. So, of course, you know, after... Um, 
after a short stay in Ushuaia, it's now time to kind of board the expedition cruise. And uh, it's kind of quite simple. So the, there's, there's a lot of questions that come to me about um, visas and things. So Antarctica is a place that is not owned by anyone. Right? It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a continent that it is not owned by anyone. And, but a lot of countries, of course, have stakes to different places. But according to the Antarctic Treaty, this is a place that can only be used for research um, and uh, expeditions. So uh, there is no visa that is really required to travel to Antarctica. What you need is a is a is a is a, is a visa or a travel uh, this one to get into Argentina and back. So that's all that you need, and you need to have a visa for the duration of your cruise as well. So if you're starting and ending the cruise in say 13 days, you need a visa for that entire 13 day duration. So that's the only thing that you need. So when you're boarding the expedition cruise, there is no real, um, what do you call, immigration, immigration formalities that happen over there. Of course, you have to hand over your passport to the ship when you kind of uh, board the cruise. And once you get off the cruise, you take you get your passports back. Because uh, you're welcomed by the expedition teams when you're boarding the ship. And so you kind of go over to your cabins, you check in and... It's always very, very important all through the expedition starting here is to try and spend as much time as possible on the deck because starting in Ushuaia itself, it's like extremely beautiful. You first pass through something called the Beagle Channel. The Beagle Channel is this thin, narrow uh, strip of water. And on either side, you have uh, Argentina and Chile. A lot of beautiful mountains. Again, this is uh, the extension of Tierra del Fuego as well. So you get these extremely beautiful landscapes on both sides. You also get to see some wildlife while you kind of get out of the Beagle Channel. So you have something called the South American sea lions. These are sometimes found in like good numbers on rocks as you kind of head out of uh, Ushuaia. You also start seeing your first albatrosses and albatrosses are a massive, a massive target for a lot of people who travel to Antarctica because... These are huge birds. These are among the largest living birds in terms of their wingspans. Uh, one, the wandering albatross, which is the largest, which has the largest wingspan of all birds, is also one of the things that we encounter on this journey. But to start with, you get something called the black-browed albatrosses. You see them like all around the ship as you kind of head out of the Beagle Channel. And of course, it's a beautiful evening. You typically start off your expedition cruise around afternoon, so the evening is extremely beautiful. And of course, this is also the last uh, uh, you know, uh, time when you actually might get a little bit of darkness before uh, the Antarctica thing. Because once you head out of the Eagle Channel, once you head into Drake Passage, you will have literally 24 hours of daylight. You have the sunset happening really late and the sunrise happening really early. So the couple of hours in between, you only get twilight. So once you're out of the Beagle Channel, you are going to have like 24 hours of light. So extremely beautiful evenings as you head out. And of course, this is just the calm before you hit something called the Drake Passage. Uh, the Drake Passage is this narrow strip of ocean that lies between South America and Antarctica. And why is this one of the most famous passages? Because this is one of the stormiest seas in the world. Right? So if you look at the uh, globe again, right, you have... Uh, this tiny little stretch between um, Argentina and Antarctica and the rest of it is all open water. So what happens is uh, the sea is kind of, it's like quite expansive till there and then it suddenly gets funneled through a narrow passage over here, kind of creating a major storm systems there all the time. Right? So you can have, you can, you can expect to have like really, really severe storms and that's one of the reasons Antarctica was not really known to humankind for a very long time. Right. So sometimes, of course, you know, you can be very lucky and you can come across something called the Drake Lake. Let me I'll play this video for you. So this was on one of the journeys that we had done. And even this year, when we had gone earlier in 2023, towards the end of the journey, it kind of started becoming a little calmer. So... This is what the Drake Lake looks like. And the Drake Lake is just absolutely, it's as if you're, you're traveling in on, on a lake anywhere inland. Right? Absolutely still waters. Your ship is going about smoothly. Uh, it's a fantastic place to be. 
But sometimes also what happens is, or actually a lot of times I would say, what happens is you actually come across something called the Drake Shake. And yeah, that's what happens on Drake Shake. This was from the 2018 journey again. This year was not as bad. We had waves about five meters. But uh, these are swells that went up to about almost 10 meters on that journey. And the ship literally bobs up and down in those waves. And it, 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 it's quite disconcerting. So yeah, as in, uh, in these kind of uh, journeys, when you're going through the Drake Passage, seasickness is to be expected. There are people who don't get any uh, seasickness at all. And uh, that's actually a blessing if that happens. But expect that you will get some amount of seasickness when you travel on, uh, uh, on the Drake Passage. But it's not just like, you know, lying in bed and just waiting to cross the Drake Passage because Drake Passage takes about two days of the journey uh, to Antarctica and two days to journey back to South America. So there's a lot of interesting things that happen. So uh, one of the reasons these expedition vessels are very interesting is that the, the expedition team is a mix of experts on different aspects of Antarctica. Like this person was talking, I think, about the, the geography of Antarctica or the history of Antarctica kind of thing at the point. But you get back to the classroom during the Drake Passage. So you have like two or three sessions happening every day, morning to evening. And uh, you just go and you learn about different aspects of Antarctica. So you learn about the history, you learn about the geography, you learn about the animals, the penguins. You have experts on whales, you have experts on seals, you have experts who talk about birding. So it's it's a very interesting uh time to spend there right you spend that hour hour and a half you get like a lot of information about antarctica and why it is such a special place as well so going and sitting in the classroom is one thing that you do the other thing that you do is of course you know you try to brave your way onto the uh deck the outer decks because if there is a drake shake there are great chances of seeing some really amazing birds like the wandering albatross now these are birds which are really, really active when the seas are rough because rough seas churn up nutrients. They churn up a lot of other wildlife underwater. And these guys have a really good busy time hunting. So you get to see a whole bunch of uh, albatrosses. The wandering albatrosses really, really are very impressive. You get the northern and the southern royal albatrosses almost rivaling the wandering albatross in terms of their size. Extremely graceful, extremely pretty. You see the light mantled albatrosses from time to time as well. Quite rare compared to the others, but again, a very different kind of albatross. You see something called the southern and the northern giant petrels. Uh, these again, uh, you get to see all the way from South America till Antarctica and back. So these are birds which you see all through your journey. You get something called the southern fulmer as well. The fulmer is very interesting because... The, full, the color of the fulmer is what a lot of navies adapt for the colors of their ships and stuff because it's extremely well camouflaged against the ocean. So there's a lot of that uh, aspect also that you kind of learn when you're on the ship. Of course, soon you're out of the Drake Passage, you're out into open seas of Antarctica and you start seeing your first icebergs. And that's actually, so there is, in fact, I think every, each of the ships has an iceberg competition. So you basically, um, you know, you need to write down what is the, what do you, when, what time do you expect to see the first icebergs? And it's actually quite a moment of pride because the data, one of the people on the data group this year won that competition. So that was, that was quite cool. And you start seeing land very soon called something called the South Shetland Islands. Um, extremely beautiful formations of rocks all of these all over the place and you start seeing and you start smelling the first penguins from far away as well so south shetland islands are very close to the antarctic peninsula these are a set of islands that form part of the antarctic uh, ecosystem and most of the time, that's where the first landings happen because you kind of arrive there the first and then you get to the peninsula. Of course, 2023, when we went in January, there was a severe storm around South Shetland Islands and uh, we couldn't really find a sheltered place to land. So we eventually decided to go further south and we actually started our landings on the Antarctic Peninsula as well. So 
we did a very different side of Antarctica in the 2023 expedition that we did, where we went directly to the peninsula. We did a whole lot of landings around the peninsula itself. So that was quite interesting. So again, these things kind of reiterate the fact that you are in like one of the most remote, one of the wildest places on the planet, something where, uh, you know, you, you basically surrender to the forces of uh, nature and uh, you actually realize how awesome nature is uh, and how it can actually control everything around us. And of course, you know, as the ship keeps going for the, it's been like traveling for two, two and a half days, you finally come to a halt and you're like, okay, what's happened? You look out of the window and you have these amazing, amazing landscapes all around. I mean, you, you're just surrounded by ice, you're surrounded by icebergs, you're surrounded by beautiful mountains and stuff. It's, it's quite the surprise when the ship stops in the midst of that. And slowly you start seeing the zodiacs coming out for exploring. Zodiacs are these rubber boats, so, so the ship can't really get very close to land. So what you do is you get on to the zodiacs from the ship and then you head out on to, uh, to explore the place. This was my first landing on my first ever expedition to Antarctica and that's why it's like super special because I landed there bright sunny day, very uncharacteristic of Antarctica but a beautiful bright sunny evening. And I just landed there and they were like, I don't know, like tens of thousands of penguins at Yankee Harbor. They were just like running all over the place, just busy with their own stuff. And I think probably this was the one landing where I clicked the maximum number of photographs that I have done in all these years. And they were just running in everywhere. So there was a bunch of penguins that were like running in from the water. They had just finished their fishing. They were just, you know, walking in. A whole lot of them using these penguin highways. And this was one of the most uh, interesting phenomena that I, I still continue to be in awe of. So because there is so much snow, uh, what penguins do is it's kind of tough to walk on snow. And uh, if you are a bird, which are these penguins, which are gentoo penguins, are about, about, about two feet tall. And uh, a penguin that's about two feet tall, if you if it has to walk through snow that's one and a half feet tall or two feet tall or more, it it, it gets quite cumbersome. It's it's not an easy task to do. So what these uh, what these birds do is they kind of walk along the same line up and down from the ocean to the nests and form what are called as the penguin highways. So they always walk on that same highway up and down. There are multiple of these highways that get formed during the season. And uh, they actually form those nice hard ground for the penguins to walk. It becomes easier for them to reach their nests and come back to the ocean. Uh, these are, so you kind of sit at penguin nests. And penguin nests are very simple. They're just made by collecting rocks and putting them together. And the, the parents incubate the eggs. Uh, sometimes you have, of course, you know, the nests need to be reinforced and things. So you have penguins coming and putting in the pebbles from around. But pebbles are a very, very, very uh, treasured commodity there because these islands, if they're, if they're filled with snow, there is very little pebbles that are available. So sometimes you also see penguins from, uh, you know, other nests quietly sneaking up and stealing these pebbles. It kind of becomes like... Uh, 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 show that these things put on it, then the, the the parent would either come back or would just notice that, snark back. It's quite quite an interesting thing to watch. Another picture of the penguins with the landscape. So for me, this particular uh, expedition kind of taught me that like in Antarctica, every lens stick, you know, from 17 mm to 400 mm, they are absolutely useful to make some very interesting shots. You can shoot like plenty of amazing photos with, you know, a very wide angle lens. You can shoot a plenty of very amazing photos using telephoto lenses as well. So I normally recommend a range from 18 mm all the way to 400 mm if you can. Get a couple of lenses which cover zooms of say, I don't know, 18 to 100 or and then 100 to 400. That's the perfect combination for me in this place because you would want to shoot a lot of things and you have very limited time because these outings that we're talking about are typically about two hours long. So you land at a place from your Zodiac and you get about two hours to explore the place before you head back to the ship. That's according to the rules of something called IATO. We'll talk about IATO a little later in the presentation. But uh, 
that's typically the way these expeditions. So in that two hours, you want to really like spend your time watching the place, admiring the place, as well as taking as many photos as you want. So it's quite a busy time, and you know it's it's amazing exploring each of these places, uh, each of these landings. A few more photographs of penguins. So uh, this is a quick history of Antarctica, you know, and it's it's. It's kind of a mix of exploration and exploitation. Uh, these are whale bones that we had seen on one of the landings. Uh, and this was probably a place where there was a whaling station sometime in the early 20th century or the late uh, 19th century. So quick uh, thing on the history of Antarctica. So Antarctica was literally unknown to people till uh, the early 1800s. Right. There were people who believed that there was some land below South America, but nobody really knew because of the Drake Passage and the really, really rough seas. We didn't have uh, ships that could take us to these places before that. So uh, it was only around 1773-74 that James Cook came within 120 kilometers of Antarctica. He started seeing the icebergs, but then I think he had to head back. Uh, around 1819, William Smith is supposed to have sighted Livingston Island in the South Shetlands and landed on King George Island as well. So among the first people to have actually been on Antarctica. In 1820, Antarctica or its ice shell was again sighted. So that was about the start of our knowledge of Antarctica and the exploration of Antarctica. So this is hardly what? Hardly 200 years ago. Uh, then 1898 was when Gerlash and his crew were able to uh, overwinter in Antarctica. And 1899 was when the British expedition built huts uh, over there. 1901 was uh, one of the momentous time because they, there was this quest to find the South Pole, right? And to reach the South Pole. 1901, Captain Scott started off his first expedition to kind of try and get there. But they were... Of course, you know, Antarctica is completely unpredictable. It's one of the stormiest of uh, uh, continents. And they reached about 82 degrees south and they all had to actually abandon and head back. And uh, 1970, 1907, 1909, again, Shackleton attempts, but uh, he has to again turn back 156 kilometers from the South Pole because his supplies were exhausted. Uh, 1909, Mawson reaches the magnetic pole. So the magnetic pole is slightly away from the geographic south pole. Uh, uh, so uh, Mawson was the first person to actually get there. And 1911 was when uh, Amundsen finally reached the south pole for the first ever time. Uh, that was a monumental achievement. Of course, there was also a tragedy that was happening in parallel. So that was Amundsen and his crew at the south pole. But in parallel, you had Scott, who was also uh, leading an expedition to reach the South Pole at the same time. And they actually reached just a few weeks later. And then they realized that Amundsen had already been there. Uh, disappointed, of course, they kind of turned back. And uh, they kind of ran into really bad weather. They lost their ways. And finally, the entire team perished in Antarctica. And they were actually just a few miles away from their supply depot. There was just no way of them knowing that uh, the depot was so close by. So that was the big tragedy that happened at that point of time. Of course, after that, again, Shackleton is a name that keeps coming up a lot during Antarctic expeditions because Shackleton is the only one who was able to, although he tried multiple times to kind of do different things in Antarctica, he was also able to make sure that none of his people perished. And, and this is the writing 15 to 17 thing was one of the great uh, stories about uh, Antarctica because uh, their ship got caught in sea ice and uh, Shackleton and set out with a small uh, party from the ship and they went all the way up to South Georgia and they were actually able to mount a rescue mission from there again, come back and rescue the entire team uh, in 1970. So that was about a two year uh, thing that everybody had to endure. A lot of stories, a lot of books written about this thing. And it's considered to be one of the greatest leadership examples uh, in, in, in the field of exploration. So why was so many, uh, so much of exploration and things happening about Antarctica? 
one was of course you know that quest to achieve fame and things but in addition to that a lot of these uh, expeditions were funded because people realized immediately that antarctica was full of seals and whales so uh, southern fur seals which were kind of uh, uh, they were kind of they were kind of hunted heavily for their fur they literally went extinct from south georgia by 1822 the moment they discovered there was such a big rush to kind of get to the fur seals that they almost finished them off a tiny colony was discovered uh, in 1931 and it was completely protected uh, so the colony has now recovered over a period of the last few decades and it's now estimated to be about a billion uh, in number uh, there's been no commercial sealing happening uh, since the 1950s so the seal numbers have recovered considerably around south georgia in fact there are there's a time of the year where it is very tough to even go to south georgia in in, in december and january because there is uh, fur seals everywhere on all the beaches and you really can't do a landing because these are really really aggressive seals so that's at least kind of in some sense there was a recovery uh, of the of the seals population uh the whales have had not ha have been a little less lucky in that sense so they apparently a point of time when the early explorers would reach antarctica and the sound of the whales was so loud that they couldn't even catch a wink of sleep there were so many whales around antarctica and quickly they started hunting the whales primarily for their oil because the oil was kind of used for lighting lamps and you know lighting your street lights for a lot of other uh, energy uh, things so the whale catches of course if you see the charts like they were literally hunted almost out to extinction before the whaling ban came in the whale numbers are slowly recovering so now when you go you actually see plenty of um, humpback whales though probably not at the levels that we probably the early explorers have seen but this time when we went uh, in january we were we, easily saw about 50 of them or maybe even more like every other every other hour there would be a whale sighting that would be happening so it was quite they kind of seemed to be recovering really fast uh the other whales are taking a little longer like blue whales and fin whales and stuff are taking a little longer to go but humpbacks are back in quite good numbers so coming back to the expedition right um this is a typical expedition this is like just an example thing this was the one uh, from my first expedition uh, in 2017 so the way it works with these expeditions is that there are a certain number of landing points in antarctica which are pre decided so there's an organization called iato which which all the expedition ships are members of now iato decides that there are these 25 30 different places where the ships can land and conduct uh, shore landings or conduct zodiac cruises and stuff uh and then depending on the date on which you're sailing and what other ships are in the area your captain kind of decides okay you know today i'm going to land here today i'm going to land here because they don't want two ships to land at the same time there'll always be only one ship landing at a landing at any point of time so they all schedule it accordingly and they land at different places so typically it's a mix of south georgia and uh, i mean sorry a mix of um, south shetlands and antarctic peninsula you have a mix of landing sites that happen and of course there is so much of landscape all around whether it is from the ship or whether it is on the landings you just can't get enough of the ice continent and here's a few uh, landscapes which for me are like special this is again from my first expedition and i really like this shot because it shows the expanse of antarctica at the same time how i got there there's a few penguins in the foreground a uh, beautiful evening light coming through it's 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 a very nice representation of antarctica for me this again is from the latest expedition that i did i really love this shot it just looks like a crown uh, and uh, the clouds coming in from the top just just love the way the whole thing came together here. this is a place called deception island and this is a volcanic island so it's all completely black so when there's plenty of snow on the island you, you get some phenomenal pattern it's it's a beautiful place to just admire and to just go crazy just taking uh, these nice creative perspectives from different places another example of antarctica a lot of times what also happens with antarctica is you have these clouds that are hanging really low so you get this very dark 
empty, desolate kind of a feel of the place where uh, you have clouds and the mountains kind of disappear into the clouds. It creates this beautiful, moody, gray kind of a thing. Extremely good for making some beautiful monochromes. Sometimes amazing light happens at sunset as well. It gives you some beautiful colors in the sky. Can't get enough of the icebergs. There's so many icebergs ranging from really tiny blocks of ice to massive ones which are miles long. And some very nice uh, patterns and structures around. Hanging icicles on this one. Uh, this was one of the icebergs that had, uh, this is one of the uh, glacier glaciers and that just carved a few moments ago. Here, another glacier. A uh, lot of glaciers all around. Glaciers are these rivers of ice that are coming down from the mountains and ending up in the sea. So you, 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 a lot of times you'll see these blocks of ice that are falling off into the ocean. That's a natural process, of course. There is so the glaciers, like I said, is a river of ice, and the river ultimately gets into the ocean. Uh, but of course, you know, global warming also. Uh, it has been observed that the carving of icebergs from the glaciers has been happening at an enhanced rate in most places. In most places, the glaciers have been retreating. A glacier that used to be like two miles uh, ahead earlier, like about twenty years ago. Today has retreated by that much. So there's a lot of change in Antarctica. Of course, it's very tough to notice that over a period of an expedition uh, to see global warming in action. But uh, it's still quite a, a beautiful place to watch. Icebergs again. One of the beautiful, beautiful evenings. This was the last evening of my uh, expedition in 2017. And we just come out to watch the evening and suddenly the sky burst into this beautiful lilac and pink uh, range of colors. Almost like a fitting farewell to Antarctica for that trip. And uh, you can start seeing like wherever you look around there are, it's very tough to find just clean landscapes because there are penguins everywhere. Like you just point your camera at one direction and you'll start seeing some penguin colony or some penguin walking around the place. And uh, they can actually be integrated into your landscape shots really, really well that way. This was a beautiful snowy day and there's this penguin just looking out into the sea. So I'm going to give a break to my talk and I'm going to ask, uh, putting out a poll out there for the next one minute. Uh, are penguins found only in Antarctica? Okay, we've been getting the answers in and I think most people are saying no. And a couple of people have said yes. I could end the poll. Thanks for participating. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess most people got it right, right? As in Anta it's not just Antarctica where penguins are found. We kind of think uh, it's, it's, it's only found in the, in, 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 in the polls. But in fact... There are only uh, six species of penguins which are reported from Antarctica. Uh, you have uh, the emperor penguins, of course, which are endemic to Antarctica. Only two of these are found only in Antarctica. You have emperors and adelies. And these are penguins which are found only in Antarctica and nowhere else in the world. The other penguins are also found in South Georgia, into South America and stuff as well, the, out of these six that we have here. Uh, but among the rest of the penguins that we have, uh, I believe, I, if I remember well, there's about 25 species. Most uh, most of the species are found around subantarctic islands and stuff. So you get a lot of species around New Zealand, the subantarctic islands of New Zealand. You get some species around uh, uh, South Georgia and Falklands. And you also have species, you have one species of penguin in Africa, uh, which is found around Cape Town. There's so many documentaries made about that. 
you have penguins all the way up to Galapagos, which is near the equator, the Galapagos penguin. So that is the northernmost penguin in the world. So uh, there is a wide range of penguins that are found all across the southern hemisphere. In that sense. So now coming back to the Antarctic thing, uh, around the peninsula, three penguins are very, very common. Uh, the, the Chinstrap, the Gentoo, and the Adelie. These are the penguins which nest in great numbers around South, uh, around South Shetlands and around uh, uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. The emperor penguin is found to uh, towards the east of the peninsula. It's a region which is a little tough to approach because of the sea ice that kind of almost juts out almost to the top of the peninsula there. So it's a it's not an approachable place. There are some expeditions that happen for the emperor penguin. But those all also involve heading out on helicopters to look for the penguins. So uh, that is a very specialized expedition that happens only looking for the emperor penguins as such. But on the peninsula trip, it's typically chinstrap, gentoos, and adelies. Sometimes people stumble upon them. Like I think this season, there were I know of at least two different ships that had stumbled upon emperor penguins through the entire season. So that sometimes happens. You have like these penguins just swimming and they reach the wrong place. Sometimes people stumble upon king penguins as well. But king penguins are again largely restricted to South Georgia. And you have some of them around South America as well. So off Chile, you get some king penguins. Off Ushuaia, there's a place where sometimes people have seen king penguins as well. So uh, these are the three penguins which are called brush tail penguins. And uh, the picture is self-explanatory. The, the tails are stiff. They're almost like these brushes. And uh, Adelie penguins are truly Antarctic penguins. They are endemic to Antarctica and uh, they nest there. We see them in good numbers. So Adelie penguin colonies sometimes are like really massive. And this is from a place called Brown Bluff, which is on the, on the northwest side of the peninsula. Extremely photogenic penguins. They have that nice little blue eye ring. And of course, penguins resort, resort to all kinds of antics. This is a way where penguins actually travel down slope. Uh, it kind of saves them energy from walking and it's much faster. They just slide on the ice. They use their belly as a skate and they just slide. And they are actually quite good at leaping from place to place as well. They're, uh this one just started, it came out of the sea, jumped onto one of the ice shelves and realized that it was not connected to land. So it actually walked to the end and again jumped onto the next one. Others are waiting to do that. So, yeah, that's how a penguin probably looks underwater. I would love to go back someday and do an underwater expedition and see how these guys swim along. But super streamlined bodies and absolutely built for speed underwater. You also have the chinstrap penguins, which absolutely uh, self-descriptory. You see that chinstrap kind of a marking around the throat. Uh, again, like, you know, found all along the peninsula and the South Shetland Islands. The, all penguins have these uh, so, uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, nesting spots, like uh, the early penguins, once, once they reach Antarctica, like at the end of winter, early summer, they're faced with a lot of snow. But the snow starts melting at the top of the, of the hill or the mountain. So these guys actually trek up all the way to the top of the hill and that's where they start nesting. So the earliest penguins, their nests are always built right on top of the mountain. So which is sometimes a lot of distance from the sea. And it's quite surprising how they would have actually made that journey all the way up through all the snow, just taking all the effort, climbing up there, bending the nest, going out, fishing, coming back. It's it's a lot of hard work. But I guess the view makes it up for them as well. So you look around and you have beautiful blue sea. You have uh, the mountains around. It's, it's fantastic views from up there. That's a penguin that's taking a rock to its nest. This is a place called Deception Island, which you had shown the picture of the uh, volcanic place. And it, this is one of the interesting places to land as well because it's got some greenery around. You don't see much greenery. You don't see much greenery in your pictures from Antarctica typically. There's one of those few places where you can actually get nice green backgrounds and foregrounds. 
this is again from Deception Island, looking down. All these guys were waiting uh, to get into the sea. It's again a very elaborate ritual for most penguins to get into the sea. I think they're very, very cautious and careful uh, that there are no predators that are waiting out for them. So they take their own sweet time and wait for the first penguin to go in and then everything kind of follows. Of course, Gentoo. Gentoo is the largest of the three chinstrap penguins, uh, three brushtail penguins. Uh, characteristic red beak. Gentoos are, are believed, so some authorities believe that Gentoos are actually multiple species that look alike. Uh, the Gentoos of Antarctic Peninsula are different from the ones in South Georgia, which are different from the ones in uh, uh, South America. Right now, I think they're classified as three different subspecies. Uh, these guys are probably the most numerous and apparently the numbers of Gentoos that people are seeing on the peninsula has been increasing tremendously over the last 20 years. They were apparently not seen in these big numbers uh, earlier. And over a period of time, they've actually been seeing the Gen 2 penguins expanding to areas where they were not seen before. And you, you spend time with them, you get some very interesting shots. They resort to all kinds of antics. And they're really, really good at jumping. So these are supposed to be the fastest swimmers among the penguins. And they're also extremely good at just ju just jutting out of water. So this rock shelf, this ice shelf must be at least about a meter high. And these guys just come out of the water and straight away jump out of the ice shelf. It's quite cool to watch them do that. And like all other penguins, they have these amazing colonies as well. So you get to the top of the hill and there's a colony of gentoos that is nesting there. It's a tough task. Like I said, you know, they have to make their way all up the snowy hill to get to that nest. Uh, early season is always a little tough to find uh, young ones. But early season is something that I really prefer because you get like a lot of snow. So you get these nice, beautiful white pictures of Antarctica. You sometimes get, uh, sometimes get lucky where the early nesters have already, uh, with the young ones have hatched from the eggs and the adults are guarding them. So this was one of those opportunities that we had in 2018. And it's not just penguins, right? There's a lot of other birds. There's something called the sheath bills. Like these look like white color chickens. These guys, like they are always on the lookout for penguin uh, nests, which are not being guarded. And they go after the eggs. Squaws, again, very similar. These guys are like the eagles of uh, Antarctica. They go after the eggs, they go after uh, young ones, kelp gulls, again, predators out there. They also do a lot of snatching of prey from the other uh, birds. Giant petrels, among the larger of the birds there, uh, again, very, very uh, uh, vicious birds. There is, I think, a video of a giant petrel kind of trying to attack this uh, group of king penguins or emperor penguins, young emperor penguins, and then you see an Adeli penguin walking in and chasing it away. That's quite cool. Just, just Google that uh, on, uh, just search for that on YouTube. It's a very interesting uh, thing to watch. And yeah, sometimes you see penguin skulls as well. A reminder of the harsh air, uh, thing in which I live. You also have Antarctic cormorants, extremely good fishers. They head out into the ocean, they fish, they come back, they breed there in Antarctica. Antarctic terns, very graceful birds. Uh, they just these nice small white birds. They fly around, they hunt around you. It's quite nice to watch them. This is not a drone shot. Drones are not allowed on Antarctica uh, by IATO guidelines because imagine 200 people flying 200 drones out there imagine the chaos that would cause out there, right? So uh, it's strictly prohibited to uh, fly drones, but uh, they you take these opportunities from the ship sometimes because you have a slight elevation of the ship. You keep watching around and sometimes you have these birds which are like right under the ship. You can make some interesting perspectives. It's not just birds, you also have seals, right? And uh, there are different species of seals that we find around Antarctica. The most famous one is the leopard seal, the one that hunts penguins, really, really uh, uh, massive uh, animals and very, very uh, charismatic. You have crab eater seals among the more common ones out there. I think these are, if I'm not wrong, these are the most numerous seals in the world. Uh, 
they are mistakenly called crab eater seals these guys don't feed on crabs much you see that pink color thing around their uh, mouth these feed on something called krill krill are these small crustaceans which form the backbone of the uh, antarctic ecosystems so everything feeds on krill uh, your penguins feed on krill your uh, uh, seals feed on krill, your massive whales come down south in the Antarctic summer to feed on krill. So the krill is supposed, is they are in like massive, massive numbers out there. And uh, all these animals, the entire ecosystem basically thrives because there is so much krill in Antarctic. Another crab eater seal. They are all over the place. Like you keep going and you find them in some very nice landscapes to shoot. You also have the Weddell seals. The Weddell seals are again an interesting story because I was watching somewhere and apparently Weddell seals at one point were only found on these big ice floats. But as the ice kind of keeps melting faster and disappearing faster, these guys have started getting up onto land a lot. We saw a lot of them this time in January. Uh, all of them just chilling out, just lazing around on, on land. And these are the big guys. These are the bass. These are the biggest seals in the world. Uh, the southern elephant seals are a, they're a couple of tons or more. Uh, I think uh, heavy, huge ones. The males tend to get really, really, really big. And uh, typically, you see them around South Shetlands. Uh, these, like that's again, you get some very nice photography. Or most of the time, they're just sleeping, they're just lazing around. But when they get up and when they kind of do these mock fights and stuff, you get some very interesting opportunities to watch and shoot them. Of course, the young ones are like super cute. They get abandoned by the parents or by the mother, I think, after a week or something. And then they're pretty much on their own. And they're just lying out there with their huge beady eyes. And sometimes they do these mock fights against the really, really among the cutest animals out there. And of course, the whales, um, the massive whales, these are humpbacks out there. We see a whole lot of whales. The humpbacks are the most showy of them all because they do, and there are a lot of them. And they keep doing this thing of, you know, putting their tails out and, you know, they keep coming out. They do with these little bit of head bopping to see what's happening. So you didn't really get to see them much better than the other whales. But typically on the expedition, people have like the uh, people cite fin whales, they cite the minke whales. Very, very momentary. These things just appear. You see the fluke, you see the tail and that's about it. Uh, but you tend to see a whole lot of species of whales. Sometimes we also see orcas or killer whales. So, uh, there's a whole lot of activity in addition to penguins and things. This is closer back to uh, the American uh, coast. You see dusky dolphins. So, once you get into the Beagle Channel, you also see dusky dolphins and a whole bunch of other things. So, I think it's uh, important to also talk about climate change. Because Antarctica is something that is one of the emblems of climate change. And why is that? Because there's so much water on Antarctica, right? And a new NASA study shows that Antarctica loses about 118 gigatons of ice every year for the past 16 years. And they account for about half an inch rise in sea levels from 2003 to 2019. Why is this important? It's because Antarctica and Greenland are places where the ice is on land. Unlike the North Pole, uh, where most of the ice is in the sea, in the ocean, and it's already been accounted for. So even if that ice melts, your sea levels aren't going to rise. But if you take Antarctica or if you take Greenland, the ice is actually sitting on land. And every drop of ice that melts out of Antarctica is going into the sea and adding to the sea level. So any extra uh, melting of ice, which is like the 118 gigatons of ice, adds to your sea levels. That's why it becomes very important, combined with the fact that Antarctica has this massive ozone uh, hole above it. It is one of the most uh, badly impacted places on Earth by global warming. I think apparently last year at some point of time, the Antarctic Peninsula had recorded a temperature of about 20 degrees centigrade or something like that. Really, really high temperatures. Can't even think of something like that happening in a place like Antarctica. So, yeah, 1823 degrees Celsius. So, that is, uh, that's one of the big changes that's happening at a place where nobody even lives. And this is a change that we are causing sitting right here in different continents, which are far, far away from Antarctica. 
Antarctic. So if you look at it, the amount of water in Antarctic ice sheet equivalent to 70 meters in Earth's ocean. So just imagine what even one tenth of that could do to our cities or our coastal cities. So the Antarctic Treaty was signed in uh, 1959 and there are 54 countries that are party to the treaty today, including India. And uh, the treaty headquarters is located in Buenos Aires. And uh, this kind of uh, makes sure that Antarctica is only uh, there for peaceful purposes. There's no military activities prohibited. A lot of countries lay claim to different parts of Antarctica. But uh, the Antarctic Treaty makes sure that all of them are like just only using it for peaceful purposes. So a lot of research goes on, uh, some amount of tourism goes on, but that's all that you can use the place for. Every, all the area south of 60 degrees south la uh, latitude comes under the Antarctic Treaty. Right. So 2048 is actually when uh, the restriction on uh, mining and you know using mineral resource resources beyond scientific research that prohibition comes to an end in 2048 and uh, after that there is again has to be a conference and again you know it has to be reviewed and it has to again be uh, enforced for the next 50 years or whatever so that becomes a very very critical timeline to kind of see what happens with antarctica beyond that but coming back here yeah, again, so this, these are a couple, these are the two daughter expeditions that we've done so far. The first trip that I did was on my own to kind of scope it out because it was an unknown place. I didn't know uh, how the whole thing would turn out. Uh, I There was a lot of unknowns in terms of the expedition, in terms of the place, in terms of the photography opportunities and stuff. But the first time I went, I was like totally blown away. I was like, look, this is a place that a lot of people need to see. It's a place where... You know, there's so much to learn, there's so much to understand, and it's just a place where you can soak in nature. So we've done two expeditions so far. The first one, the one on the top is from 2018, and the one below is from earlier this year uh, when we had gone in uh, January. A uh, little bit of thing on the upcoming expedition, which is happening in uh, uh, in December, December 6th to 18th uh, is when we are going to do the next expedition. We're doing this in collaboration with a company called Quark. We had traveled with them in 2018 as well and uh, very, very professional organization works with a very good team of experts. And this time we were actually able to uh, put together this trip on a brand new ship called Ultramarine. Ultramarine just came into commission last season. Uh, it has a capacity of about 200 passengers. And uh, in addition to all the new facilities and stuff, this is a ship that's got like probably one of the best outer deck kind of facilities out there. So you can spend all your time out there just watching things. Uh, of course, new ships, so a lot of luxury. We've kind of uh, taken something called the Explorer Suites on the ship there. The main thing for me on this expedition is the helicopter ride. So this is a ship which has a few helicopters on board and included in the two, in the main tour itself is I think a 15 to 20 minute helicopter ride for all the passengers. So where you actually get a very, very interesting view of Antarctica, you get the, you get an aerial view of Antarctica and because drones are not allowed here, this is probably the closest that we can get to in terms of getting a nice aerial view and getting a lot of interesting aerial photographs of the place. And of course, if somebody wants to do a longer expedition, there's also an option to sign up for a longer ex uh, helicopter uh, ride as well. I forget uh, the duration. I think it's closer to an hour. But you can actually do a longer helicopter expedition as well if somebody's interested. That's, that's an additional thing that someone can sign up for. So, yeah. So, it's basically, uh, it's a brand new ship and we're going to be doing helicopter sightseeing. And of course... Uh, the other thing that's that's included in this trip is the transfer from Buenos Aires to Ushuaia and back. So uh, we're going to be on a chartered flight that will take us from Buenos Aires to Ushuaia. We get onto the ship, we do the expedition, we come back to Ushuaia and take the flight back to Buenos Aires. So all that kind of gets included in the trip. In addition to that, I kind of uh, missed actually adding it out here, which is uh, this trip is, is longer than the previous trips because we get one extra day in Antarctica. Uh, in addition to that, we also have one day around Cape Horn. Cape Horn is the southernmost part of South America. 
So we we try and do two landings there, one in Cape Horn and another place called Diego Ramirez, where you have a nesting colony of albatrosses. And that's a really, really cool place to also visit. So these are the two, these are the, so that's the other very interesting thing about this tour that we're doing. And uh, yeah, by like we have this uh, offer on the tour price from Park, and uh, if you sign up by June twenty fifth, we have a very very good uh, 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 tour pricing happening. I can't uh, uh, and I talk about the tour price because this is something that's a really special offer that we've got. So if you're interested, just drop me a message either the chats here or drop me a WhatsApp message or just email me. And I'll send you across the details of the tour as such as, you know, about the pricing and things. So we have this open till the end of the month. We originally had to kind of close it by 15, but we've negotiated another 10 days uh, because people needed a little bit more time to uh, make up their mind. So we have another 10 days. So uh, just just drop me a message if you're interested and I'll, I'll share the details with you. So sorry, I ran over by about 10 minutes more than what I had planned. Uh, but thank you uh, for joining the session. And uh, let me just look at the chats and see what are the questions we answered. If you have any questions, just feel free to unmute and ask or just ask in the chats and I'll uh, reply to that. Uh, Sharad asked, are there any instances of accidents during Drake Passage? Uh, not really. I think yeah, Ram has also answered that. Uh, there is, yeah, like Ram said, basically these are like very stabilized ships. These are modern technology. So they are very well equipped to deal with storms. Also, what happens is if the storm is too severe, uh, we end up spending a little bit more time either around Antarctica or around uh, uh, South America. So that, you know, you weather that kind of, that's only happened once uh, so far for me. But typically that is the other thing. So they, they kind of, of course, depending on the severity of the storm and how high the swell is, the waves are, the ship captain, of course, takes a call and makes sure that safety is, uh, uh, is followed. The smaller ships, there are, that's the reason we choose ships which are about 200 uh, strong. Because even ships which are about 100, 120, can be quite uncomfortable on the Drake Passage. Like the first ship that I went with uh, was about a 114 capacity ship. And I remember actually having to clutch my bed and, and sleep because I everything around the room was getting thrown all around the place. That hasn't happened in the bigger ships. So I that's why I kind of prefer ships which are about 200 because that gives a lot more stability. You're spending about four days on the Drake Passage. So you would need to have something that's a little bit more comfortable. Than, uh, and a more comfortable ship means that you, the probability of having seasickness also comes down. Parag Joshi, are penguins afraid of humans? Can we get close? Uh, they are not really afraid of humans because there have never been humans in Antarctica, right? And we've they've only been seeing humans intermittently for the last 200 years. Uh, they don't really have that, uh, that scare of humans as such. They walk towards you. Uh, can we get close? Uh, so the rules, so again, there are very strict rules when we do uh, uh, the shore landings. There is a trail that you have to follow. You cannot stray off the trail because that is for the safety of both the birds as well as us, especially where they are like seals and all lying around. So you stick to the trails and uh, you have to be at least, I think, three meters away from a penguin. If you see a penguin, you stop three meters away. And that's kind of the rule out there. If the penguin walks towards you, that's fine. Uh, you just kind of stay there. You don't do any movements. Uh, it passes and goes by. So that's the way, uh, you know, uh, you maintain safety of both the penguins as well as people. If the stay is on the ship only and landing is done subsequently, why is the excursion only two hours? Uh, so basically what happens is that... Uh, this, the landings happen at different places. So although on the map, it looks deceptively close, each of those landings can take about three, four hours to travel from one place to the other, at least. Some of these can take much longer, right? So that is one of the reasons, of course, the other reason is, of course, the IATO guidelines, because the IATO guidelines are very, very uh, uh, mindful of the fact that they want tourism to be 
uh, sustainable for the next few generations, right? Not just for this time or whatever. So they make sure that the landings are only two hours because your uh, the amount of time that you're actually out there and the wildlife gets disturbed or whatever gets limited quite, quite considerably. And uh, each landing, only 100 people are allowed on shore. So if there's a ship of 200 people, basically 100 of them get off, spend two hours and then go back and then the next 100 come. So if you're doing two landings a day, combined with uh, you know the four hours or five hours and you need about an hour to go out and scope and find good landing spots for the expedition team to go and chart out the trail for people to walk. So about five to six hours is the whole logistics for landing. So if you take five plus five hours and then about a couple of hours to get from place A to place B, that pretty much takes up the whole day. So that's why even from that perspective, as well as the sustainability perspective, it's, 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 it's restricted to two hours at one place. What about the internet availability during the trip? Uh, pre, uh, the internet is, uh, some ships offer basic internet facilities. It's kind of uh, restricted. Uh, it's kind of like dependent on what ship you're traveling by. The last time we went on Quark, Quark had a package which included WhatsApp connectivity without any attachments, free for everybody on the ship. And you could buy uh, other packages on the ship for more usage if you want to make calls or if you want to send attachments and stuff. But be mindful again that we are in like a very, very remote part of the world. So all connectivity is through satellite. And the importance is for the ship navigation systems and their uh, internet connectivity over the over the travelers. So the internet can be very unreliable. It can be very slow. There are times when the internet doesn't work. So all that can also be there. So I would assume that there is going to be no internet once we get off, uh, get, uh, you know, sail out of South America till we come back. Anything that you get beyond that is a blessing. So you can actually buy up, uh, you can buy internet packs on the on board uh, to kind of use it for a certain number of hours. But again, that is very, very unpredictable. Sharad, yeah, like I answered earlier, Sharad, uh, there are two landings that are uh, done in a day. So if it's a, uh, so for the 13 day trip, we are doing about five days in Antarctica and uh, one day in Diego Ramirez and the Cape Horn. So we will typically be doing about two landings every day. So expect about uh, 12 uh, uh, excursions. Now the excursions could be different kinds. One is the shore landing where you actually get off and walk. Uh, another excursion could also be where you are actually only in the Zodiac. So places with a lot of icebergs and stuff, you also do something called a Zodiac cruise, where you're in the Zodiac for those two hours and you kind of go exploring the entire area as such. So all your photography happens from the Zodiac itself. Uh, the helicopter expedition also would be part of one of these expeditions because it's again an operation which you, know, you kind of head out. So typically, uh, I would expect about 12 excursions to happen during the uh, during a 13 day trip. Wind factor during zodiac trip gusts uh, that is uh, uh, that is of course a factor blame. So there are areas where we land and suddenly the wind direction changes and there's a lot of wind uh, or there's a lot of uh, uh, more than the wind the swell the, uh, the the waves kind of coming up quite a bit where getting into a zodiac or getting out of zodiac may not be possible. Sometimes uh, we might have to, like, there, there might be just a change of plans. You know, you go there and then, you know, these guys try to land and they say, okay, you know, we cannot do a zodiac landing. You typically, the ship changes course and goes to another place where you can actually go to uh, uh, this one. You can actually go to another place and hopefully land there. So depending on the weather conditions and stuff, that also might happen. Arnab, uh, yes, seals are the epic predictor uh, seals, and of course, you also have your orcas, uh, which are the apex predators out there. Uh, Parag Joshi, how many landings per day? Two landings per day is what is planned. Uh, sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, depending on uh, how the weather is and stuff. Sharad, how would the 13 day breakup look like? So 13 days, basically the first day you're gonna be in uh, Buenos Aires. The second day we fly to Ushuaia and we board the ship. Uh, day three, day four, we are in the day Drake Passage. Uh, actually, uh, hold, on, hold on, day three, we are actually in Cape Horn and uh, Deva Ramirez. Day four, five, we are in Drake Passage. Then uh, six to 10, we are in Antarctica and South Shetland. 11, 12, we are again in the Drake Passage and 13, we get back to Ushuaia. So 
roughly about five days in uh, Antarctica and South Shetland Islands and one day in Cape Horn and uh, Diego Ramirez. Arpit, uh, temperature range, we are going to be there in the southern summer. So the temperatures would not be really cold. It's I would say the range would be between minus five to plus five degrees uh, centigrade outside. Inside the ship, of course, it's all temperature controlled. So it's all absolutely, you can actually walk around in a t-shirt and things. But outside, it will be between minus five to plus five degrees uh, centigrade. It's not really very cold. Sometimes you have a little bit of wind chill, but uh, it's quite manageable. So that's the questions I have in the chat window. Anybody else? Uh, Sharad, best time for the expedition? So the expeditions only happen between October and uh, uh, kind of end of February, March. Uh, different times are good for different things. Like I would typically not. So this time, in fact, we had a very good offer for an, for an expedition in October uh, and one for early November. Now, the problem with that kind of time frame is that it's really too early in the season. So, this, the ice could be blocking. You may not have too many places to visit and stuff. So, it's a little tough to do. And it, uh, it, it, I would say there's not too much activity also happening in that time. It's just about the time when the penguins have started coming. There's not too many whales out there. Uh, I usually like to do either December or January because that's still a little early on. And uh, you still have a lot of snow. The penguins have started nesting, the whales have, are already there, the seals are already there. So you have a whole lot of things to photograph at that point of time. Of course, the whales are all very busy feeding. So a lot of times what you see is just the tails or the back of the whales or you just see them going around and stuff. Now, when you uh, go later than that into February and March, the penguins, most of them would have finished nesting, most of them would have disappeared. There's just a few of them around the place. Because it's also towards the end of the season, the landings tend to be quite uh, uh, the landings tend to be quite dirty as well. So normally, but that time towards February and March is excellent if you want to go and see whales because the whales have all all have all done with their feeding. They're all getting ready to go back further north for uh, breeding. So they start playing. So there's a lot of breaching. You see the whales jumping out of water, kind of things and all happening. So each part of the season is. Good for different things. My personal favorite is doing it in uh, December, January because it's still white. It's quite nice. It's beautiful Antarctica the way you would kind of expect it. Uh, Viral Mehta, uh, I will send you the the budget and the round trip cost overall from India. I'll I'll, I'll send that to you by email. Like I uh, like I mentioned earlier, we cannot discuss it online in a public forum. Uh, because we've really, really managed a good deal from them. So, uh, Ram, uh, yes, the helicopter excursion is part of the upcoming uh, deal itself. So, it's part of the tour package as such. It's a short ride. It's about a 20-minute ride that we have as part of uh, the expedition. Of course, in addition to that, there is also an optional thing for a longer ride. So, while you do a shorter ride as part of the expedition, you could also sign up for a longer uh, helicopter ride. Arpit specialized clothing, uh, not really so much. So basically, clothing is very simple. It's not really cold, right? So basically, you take a set of uh, uh, thermals and uh, you have your regular clothing on top. Uh, you have gloves and uh, you have something to cover your head. What the uh, what the expedition team gives you is uh, you get a jacket uh, which you also get to keep uh, from Quark. The jacket contains an inner shell which is your uh, which is a thermal shell which kind of keeps you warm and an outer shell which is your wind and uh, water resistant kind of thing. So it's quite a nice jacket to have for the expedition. And uh, you also get uh, so Quark also loans or all these expedition ships loan uh, these gum boots. So for all the landings, you use those gum boots. So typically from our side, there's really not much to carry from here. It's just uh, thermal inners. You need to carry a good uh, waterproof trouser, either a, a rain pant or a, or a ski pant kind of thing, and uh, gloves and something to cover on the head. That's basically what is needed from a clothing perspective. Quite simple.
thanks for joining sharad um, i would I'll, I'll connect with you Are there any other questions? Uh, if you if, if you have any other other questions, just unmute yourself and you can ask as well. So these are anyway the website uh, the website data.in anyway has all the details of the upcoming trip and uh, just feel free to reach out to me just drop me an email or a, a whatsapp message and uh, i'll get back to you with all the details of the trip as such so yeah just so i think thanks so much everyone for joining and I can see the flood of messages on the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking out the time on a weekday. I'll share the uh, the link to this talk uh, after it is done. I'll download it and I'll share the YouTube link. If you would like to share it with your friends, please, please go ahead. I would request you all to also share this with anybody who might be interested uh, because Antarctica is a wonderful, wonderful place. As in for me, this is one of the most special places that I've been to. And uh, Really, really, every time I go back, I really look forward to going back there because that I have braved the Drake Passage uh, six times now. And uh, I'm still here. I'm talking to you guys. So it's it's not it's, it's not tough as such, but at the end of the Drake Passage, you have this really wonderful world, which is like another, completely another planet. Uh, one of the wildest places on Earth. So really look forward to seeing you guys at some point of time traveling with me to Antarctica. And thank you so much again. So I will stop uh, sharing and uh, stop the talk. Let me know if you have any questions. Please feel.